We must all do theatre to find out who we are and to discover who we can become. Welcome to the Unmasked Podcast, where we venture underneath and beyond the surface, revealing the lesser known stories of passion pursuers and change makers. I am your host, Bindu, and today the curtains rise on the transformative world of self discovery through theatre. Meet Alba Rose, a drama teacher, outdoor enthusiast, and homeschooling mom who starts off describing herself as being quirky. And then she invites us into her world of theatrical wonders. Join us as we uncover her journey where the spotlight shines not only on the stage, but also on life's most profound lessons. We discuss how chance encounters can change the course of our lives and chart our journey. And get ready to challenge the conventional wisdom as we navigate the value of degrees versus skills in today's dynamic landscape. Make sure you stay till the end for a curated collection of book recommendations by Alba. Each one of them a gateway to boundless wisdom and inspiration. This is an episode where education, theatre and timeless life lessons intertwine. A show you definitely don't want to miss. So let's dive in together. Hi Alba and welcome to the Unmasked podcast. I am really excited to have you on this podcast after our conversation last time. Uh, I realized that there's so much to you, more than I know. What I have been is uh, a, a person standing and watching you at a distance behind the scenes uh, when you when you direct the children and I'm like something that has always struck me before I got to know you is uh, the passion that you have and the energy that you bring uh, and I'm very very curious to go be- beneath that surface and see where's that drive coming from. Thank you, Bindu. I'm uh, very happy to be doing this. Uh, I think uh, I've connected with you and uh, it's such a such a seamless connection, you know, and I can't wait to explore what we have here. Super. Excellent. So let's start from the very beginning. So who is Alba? Uh, where did you grow up? What were your growing years like to your journey to where you are today? Okay, so who is Alba? I think Alba is uh, extremely passionate and sometimes uh, this passion can come off uh, a little strong to the people around me. So yeah, I'm I'm very, very passionate. I'm extremely emotional, uh, very driven. Uh, I'm always on the edge. Like it it could take a a well-written poem about uh, somebody living in Canada who's who's, uh, finding it difficult to identify where they where they are for me to just start bawling just a poetry i could start crying just listening to somebody else read that poem uh, and I, that has happened to me multiple times in classes uh, where i'm trying to find my 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 grips you know about like okay alba you're the grown up here don't cry <laughs> so uh, yeah that's that's who i am i had a very um, unconventional uh, life growing up uh, both my parents uh, were entrepreneurs. My mom is a beautician. Today's her birthday. <laughs> my mom is a, a beautician and uh, she she didn't have like a parlor or something. She'd go to people's homes and she would, whatever they needed, she would get it done in the comfort of their own houses. So in that way, she was able to really manage the kind of work that she wanted to take, the timings she wanted to work and things like that. And similarly for my father, he uh, ran a, a workshop. Uh, where he, a manufacturing workshop and he kind of built um, kitchen equipment and these commercial ovens and things like that. And he's basically done the kitchen for uh, some really great places in Bombay. Um, So because of these two parents and the kind of lifestyle they lived, our life growing up was like we just get up and go and we just get up and travel and uh, we'd go every weekend to this beach village that uh, was very close to Bombay every weekend until my brother started school because when uh, my brother started school me and my sister were in a girl's school 
and they had the weekends off. My brother, unfortunately, had school on Saturdays. And that completely threw our entire schedule. And I hated it because I was like, we had the weekends and now we don't. And he, he had a chutti on uh, Thursday and one on Sunday. And it completely threw our, our uh, family's timetable off. But yeah, so I kind of grew up in this very outdoorsy, extremely passionate. I don't think there was any class growing up my mother didn't put me in. There was this beautiful place. Um, it's in... Um, in Santa Cruz, which is like 20 minutes from Bandra, and uh, it's called Balkanji Wadi. Basically, they have these extremely uh, pocket friendly classes for children over there, and they do everything they do gymnastics, skating, art. And my mom would take me at least four times a week there for classes after school because she just wanted me to do everything. Strangely, the only class I never actually took growing up was drama. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very ironic, strange. isn't it? Very ironic, <laughs> extremely. But of course, there wasn't ever an event in school that was like drama, theater, performance related that I was not a part of. If it was in my peripheral, I was a part of that event in some fashion. Okay. okay. Yeah. Wow. So there are a couple of things that I'd like to deep dive into. So you said that you had a you had a very outdoorsy life growing up. Yeah. So just describe how that looked like. Um, so we'd go and we'd, uh, so my, my mom, she, her family is this fisher folk family. They're from Bandra and a lot of her mom's parents and all, and her mom's siblings, they lived in this place called Uttan Gorai, which is, uh, this beach town, which is a fisher folk town, which is like two hours from Bandra. Now, uh, we'd spend our every, almost every weekend there when we were in school, in school months. And when we were in summer holidays, we'd be in Mangalore, we'd be in Goa, we'd be in Mysore, we'd be in Bangalore. So we had family and my parents would just like, you know, that we would wait for those two, two months of summer because we'd book our train tickets well in advance. And then just before uh, the, the holiday was about to come, my dad would go buy us new haversacks, buy us new uh, sports shoes. That was usually how the summer would, uh, would start to unwind. And it used to be very, very fun. And I was always an extremely outdoorsy. Uh, the thing my dad, I think um, my dad wanted a summer. I think so. So when I when I was growing up, he refused to acknowledge in in many ways that I was uh, a girl and I and I was not very feminine. I had a very masculine energy. Like I would climb up on trees. I would uh, compete with the boys. And if if the boys in my in my uh, group said that they could do something, I'd be like I can do it better. So I was always like that. I'd climb up trees and I'd get I'd get beaten up. I'd beat up people. You know, when I was in my, I think I was in my 10th or 11th, when my, all of my friends, my guy friends, they started going for kickboxing classes. It was a trend at that time. And I wanted to do it as well because they were all doing it. My mom refused to let me go. She said, no, you can't join kickboxing because you're already beating up people. And if you know the proper techniques of it, it's going to be even worse. So she did not. But then I eventually convinced her and I did go for okay. kickboxing classes. But yeah, so... We would be out and about, we'd be in nature, we'd be, um, I talked to trees. I had this very strange thing when I was, when I was really young that I would sit next to a tree. I put my hand on the bark and I would pretend like I'm talking to it and it's talking back to me. And in my adult, uh, in my adult life now, I have also found myself doing that sometimes. I still do it. <laughs> I talk to trees. And do you know the trees do have a life of its own? There yeah. is actually a book. Yeah. Uh, where uh, there is a research into the whole life of trees. I think it's called Life of Trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it talks about how the whole network of trees have their own life and they, they have friends and their roots are all connected. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they have feelings. Yeah. So they actually are interconnected and they take care of themselves. And uh, it's, a, it's a lovely book. You should read that. So it, you wouldn't realize, you would realize then that you're not talking back home. It's yeah. actually real. <laughs> you're dipping into their energy. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll mark that book when I get that. Yeah, exactly. so I, I, there was this one tree on the beach in Gorai, which is a people kachar, and it's right at the beach. And the waves would sometimes uh, in high tide, the waves would go past the tree. 
so my dad would have me climb up on the the like 10 15 feet up and he'd be like when the wave is coming you jump into the water from 10 15 feet and i have done that and my mother would just be standing like you know 200 meters trying to uh trying to get him to stop and he, she'll be like you're trying to kill my children what are you doing and my dad be like no no she can do this and i would do i would bizarrely do all sorts of crazy things if if my had my father's backing if my father said do it i would do it and like if he knows if he thinks it's great uh, nothing will happen i'll be fine wow so that was your back you knew that you had your back uh, protected you're like yeah, okay yeah. i can do it yeah i was uh, very very close to my father growing up he actually it's been a little over a month now that he's passed away mm-hmm. i was very very close to him but then um like whatever he said he told me that until i finish my 10th grade i cannot have boyfriends and while everybody in my neighborhood was having boyfriends i was like no My dad said no, and I may have a crush on a boy or whatever, but like uh, I don't see the point in it, and which is why I was also left out from a lot of like fun things that all of these guys were doing because I'd always be the third wheel then with no boyfriend, and I, you know there was this one boy who'd come and stand outside my house, and uh, he's so stupid this fellow. He just come and he like literally just stand staring into my house. He was as old as me only, so it was not very creepy. But my dad will be like, "Hey, he likes you, and he wants to be your boyfriend." And I'll be like, "Daddy, you said I can't have a boyfriend, so why are you encouraging this? Tell him to go." <laughs> so uh, we had this. Um, we'd be able to talk about anything. We'd go into the night, sometimes two o'clock, three o'clock, sitting and talking about life. And my dad always had this very uh, beautiful saying. He'd say that when you step out of the house, and if you see a neighbor, and uh, you don't smile at them. nothing no points are cut from from your points of life if you smile at them you get a point and so you know think of this as like sometimes doing good things for for anybody may may get you in in a place in life where you didn't imagine you would be so like what's the harm smile at the people and he do this you know every sunday just before or um, after sunday mass he would go to the entire neighborhood home by home saying hi everybody how are you happy sunday and he would do this so he was this kind of a person i was actually not very close to my mom growing up um yeah but my dad i was and do you still smile at strangers today i do i do i find it extremely easy to make friends um i could make friends with anybody on the street uh, especially kids uh i it's not very difficult for me to make uh, friends with kids i think when a lot of children see me for the first time they're actually taken aback by how silly i can be and they're like wow this is an adult who's being extremely weird there's something about it let's dive in and explore <laughs> so uh, i think uh, kids kids find it very easy to be friends and um, yeah um, so, so it's like that child like energy still alive yes yes I- It's interesting that you brought this up a couple of times. Where there's we we kind of distinguish between an adult and a child, and children are supposed to be playful and fun and energetic and all of that. And then adult is, I don't know, stereotypically boring. And that's that's how I think the world views these two big segments. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, so I think I'm extremely whimsical. uh and i think that i have a fondness for people that also are and the place that i work with and uh, and the people that i work with it's a by product like if you are not fun and entertaining children are not going to want to be a part of your the story that you're telling um so it's it's very sad actually that people lose this this joy of life and living and they get so occupied with things in fact just today as i was scrolling doom scrolling on instagram before here um i saw this reel about the pedi lady is talking about none of us know who our grandfather's grandfather was hmm. that means three or four generations down everything that you own everything that you've built all of your memories will be gone there'll be nobody who knows you and knows your life that is going to continue to you know to to keep you in their thoughts because you're four generations down maybe now because of this digital um, digitalization of people's lives maybe you'll still live on in mm. some cloud somewhere but people won't actually have you in their thoughts as much 
so when you're investing in in life and you're investing in things and materials you've got to be so conscious about what you're prioritizing because if you're prioritizing this car that you that you want to spend like um you know uh, 75% of your paycheck on and then 8 years from now is going to just not be here yeah. so what are you prioritizing so i think uh, people need to start being more conscious yeah that's profound <laughs> <laughs> yeah instagram <laughs> at its best so what do you think why do you think people end up adults end up becoming stereotypically boring mm, i think that's what they know and that's what they've seen um i think i was blessed to have uh, two parents who uh, who did not shy away from following their heart in a lot of the things they do my mother is also she's really crazy um you know we we have this row house in nasik and she's basically the only one living there now and my son lived with her for 2 years uh when in in his first 2 years of his life and she's the only person there and it's a four bedroom home with some six bathrooms she has a fixation about building bathrooms that i cannot and she wants a pink bathroom she wants a blue bathroom like all her bathrooms are you know they're color coordinated in the way they are so i feel like uh, sometimes you have to embrace your your cooks you know and uh, just enjoy it and play and explore things that you don't do otherwise and and do things that are outside your comfort zone and be passionate about learning new things mm-hmm. i think learning new things is something that we forget to do on the way of life and uh, i love to learn if you tell if you put me in a class um, uh, where somebody else is taking like a workshop or something i love being a learner i love learning new things i have been actively trying to teach myself spanish on duolingo for the past decade now <laughs> i have reached nowhere uh but yeah i think i love to learn and i think um, that's that's the curiosity of wanting to know more learn more ask questions is what keeps children um as interesting as as they are yeah. um and i think adults uh, they forget they think now that i have reached this point i know everything that i need to know and that's it i'm done and then life uh, becomes monotonous with paying bills and um and family functions um i cannot be caught dead at a family function i <laughs> i i find it very difficult to um, I, you know it's so funny i think i have a split personality because i'm extremely social and very friendly but if you put me in a family gathering and you ask me to socialize i will just stand by the wall like and as freeze. <laughs> and freeze it's very strange yeah <laughs> I I I love the things that you talked about in terms of how what kind of keeps adults into getting into the stereotype. Uh but I'd love to deep dive into the learning bit that you said. Uh because I think that's one critical space that as adults we kind of begin to think that we kind of know it all yeah. or it's all our experience that yeah. begins to speak. And sometimes I feel that experience can be uh experience changes so yeah. it's not something that we if we experience something the first time it does not mean in the same context we're going to experience the same way but there is a tendency and i've seen it as well i say no from my experience this is what's going to happen from so that kind of i think brings in a kind of a filter in everyone's eyes yeah. and you begin to see the world only a particular way I think that that's the place where when you say get out of your comfort zone learn I think that's where you keep that lens always clean yeah and make sure those uh, the, the view is still open and curious so how do you do that so I had a very uh, strange uh, education uh, life like my childhood and my education was very weird I was a topper in everything in the first 5 years in school like until 5th grade I was um topping every class i could be in and then fifth grade onwards i started to go downhill i became extremely fidgety extremely difficult in a classroom i would ask questions that my teachers didn't know how to answer um i would be uh, very easily bored and i was doing badly i was failing left right center i would get single digit uh, scores in uh, most subjects um, that i didn't like 
and then um, I'd be a troublemaker because of all of that. Uh, I was a very big troublemaker in school. Then um, in my ninth grade, uh, a lot of things happened in school and uh, I flunked my, uh, my ninth grade and I flunked maths, which is algebra, geometry and Marathi. Okay. Now, after I flunked it, my school said, you should repeat the year and you should take these subjects again. And then I thought to myself, I've done so badly the first time I attempted it. It's not going to change so much because my interest does not lie in, lie in these subjects. I'm not good at it. I feel like I do not even understand the basics and I'm really bad with math. I cannot tell you how bad with math I am. Um, and then I started exploring options that I could do without having to, you know, repeat a year and waste a year and whatever. And then I stumbled upon NIOS. Um, it, the, the college that was doing NIOS, which is St. Andrews, uh, was like a, a five, 10 minute walk from my house. So I stumbled upon that. And, um, and at the time, strangely, I was told that NIOS was for people that were, were had learning disabilities, people who was people of determination, people who um, were not very good at academics and in, in a way they were stupid or whatever. And um, I did it anyways and I did really well, okay. I chose subjects that interest me. I chose business management and economics and computer science and English literature and home science and all this really, really fun stuff that otherwise I would not have got the option of doing it in your uh, traditional schooling. And I was really good at it and I did really well in, in most of the sub, in, in some, in subjects. And then, uh, but I started feeling a little ashamed and I started feeling embarrassed about the fact that I was doing NIOS because the people around me, the, my friends, my, my friends' parents, and all of these guys started telling me that NIOS is being done by people who aren't very good at what they want to do. This is just for them to have like some degree, could you be degree because you need a degree. So whatever. Uh, and so I started feeling really embarrassed about it. And um, I would hide that I was doing an IOS when I remember I did 11th, I did my 10th in an IOS. And then for my 11th grade, I moved to NASIC and I studied in a college there. And I did not tell anybody for that entire year that I had actually done an IOS. I told everyone that I had done like your normal SEC uh, exam. Um, yeah, I was I was very embarrassed by by doing an IOS, but with life experiences mm -hmm. and uh, having now understood uh, the this this the the establishment and understanding this platform that is NIOS, I'm starting to see what a beautiful thing it really is. And it's so strange because as Indians, we're called, as, as um, uh, you know, South Asians, we're constantly looking at Western uh, education systems and we're like, wow, they're so, they're so great and they give you so many options and they're so flexible. But NIOS has been here for decades now. And it's a shame that, that we don't know of it enough. And it's a shame that we think of it as just could be when actually it's doing, it's doing what it's putting the child first. It's putting the child's interest first. It's putting the child's skills first and you can tailor make what you want to do and you can do it so well. So I feel like we need to talk more. I think an iOS needs to become more mainstream within families, within, uh, of course, homeschoolers now, it's a thing. And I, and now that I am homeschooling my son um, and I'm already thinking about, you know, what kind of things he could do when he reaches that point. Because of course, he's very young now. But, you know, it's such a shift of how I've been thinking about NIOS. Now I think of it as such a great tool. Mm. I wish I had seen it. I wish the people around me, the adults around me, were, had made a little bit more educated um uh you know um uh, had given me more educated advice mm -hmm. had they not told me i need to be ashamed of it i would have owned it um yeah and you know because of nios um for the first so so when i okay after nios i moved on and uh, i i i did my uh, 12 standard again with nios um, and I, again, I did very well. And then I moved back to NASIC and I joined a BBA course. 
and six months into the course i realized this is not for me i thought i could do it because my dad had his own company i thought i'll do business management and i'll take over his company and all that and then again i started i was i was into writing poetry at the time i was into reading books at the time so eventually the shift happened and i could not um, i could not do bba anymore i dropped i dropped out of it and you know my mom uh, she told me just because you've dropped out mid year doesn't mean you're going to be able to sit at home so go to bombay and uh, go and check in the college that you are interested in to do literature whether they're going to take you and i was at sapphire college i went and i checked everything and i had that chotu nokia dabba phone at the time i called my mother and i said listen they're saying in mid year and all they can't take uh, people you know you i've got to apply next year she's like great go to the next go to the first uh, newspaper stand you see go pick a newspaper and look where they're saying there are vacancies for jobs go find yourself a job don't come back home until you have a job because you are not sitting 6 months at home doing nothing and i went and i looked and then there was a um, there was a requirement for a writer at rajshi productions the one that does all of that used to do salman khan's movies mm-hmm. and um, i went there for an interview and i was there um, with another three four people who were adults at the time and i was barely 18 and i got the job and then i worked with them for almost 6 7 8 months as a, a, a executive content writer and that was my first proper paid legit paid job uh, that i tried to do even after i started college again at sapphires but i was not able to manage the hours mm-hmm. so then i did my then i did sapphires and somewhere in the middle of sapphires uh, my um, my family life started to rock a little bit my parents were getting a divorce and they were on and off and my dad uh, said that i needed to be financially independent and that he was not going to pay my bills anymore and he was not going to pay the ac bill anymore i remember this conversation was so bizarre um and i and i thought i'll get a job i um i asked around and at that time it was a fashion everybody was doing side hustles at um, at these uh, what what they called uh customer service na call center call centers shucks <laughs> yeah at call centers and i thought uh, okay uh, i'll also do a call center gig how and everyone's doing it it's really fun and let's try it and i did it for like a month or two it was uh, not my thing this sitting down and talking to people and uh, we were talking to people in the uk and they were extremely racist like i would find myself every third call i was giving somebody a good year full and you know they'll be like you indians why are you calling and i'll be like excuse me okay don't speak like that <laughs> <laughs> and then my floor manager at that time would literally come and stand next to me and beg me to put the phone down because he'd get in trouble and then i realized that this is again not for me and then uh, luckily one of my mom's clients uh, who is a drum who was a drama teacher at the time she could not take a drama class she would work for a private company who would take extra curricular activities after school and she called me up one day she knew that i was inclined towards the performance arts and she called me up and she said will you take my class for me as a substitute i said first outright no because i don't know where i want to go and do your work for you and all that then she said listen that is money i will give you money and i will give you the resources and i thought ki wow okay like even if it is 100 bucks for an hour 100 rupees an hour at that time meant i could have four orange juices in school for four days consecutively so i was like great sign me up i will come i will take the class and i did and i didn't pay too much attention about who was around me at the time when i was doing this class but apparently the person who ran that establishment she was there she saw my class she was very impressed and she called me the next day for an interview and she said you come and i'll give you a part time job so then at the time i was 20 yeah uh, 19 almost 20 and uh, ever since then i have not stopped teaching theater it's been now 32 so that's 12 years now i've been teaching theater at that time when i was in college i'd finish college at about 4 o'clock in the evening and i would go and take a 6 to 7 7 to 8 class um, every day of the week and then eventually i was told that if you take classes in the weekend you will get paid almost three times because weekend classes it's it's good it's a good pay and i started doing weekend classes so i was basically working pretty much all the days of my my week um, as a college student and i did not have too much time for a social life or like parties 
it was not my thing and then eventually it became a part of who i am um i became this person who always like if i was spending my time it had to be me doing something that had some value to it i couldn't just go and like sit at a party it would uh it would just drive me mad that i'm just sitting here not doing anything like oh maybe i should read a book because then i'll be learning something new and i'm trying to to fix that i'm trying to be a little bit more just enjoy the moment and you know got it yeah it's been interesting to hear how you stumbled into the whole theater world that yeah. you right now own that's so this lucky yours. Me. yeah it's very lucky so the, it's that moment i guess when you got that call yeah. to do that particular class this imagine that's like a what a transition into yeah and had she not thought about it in, in fact you know for me like i had of course seen in school whenever somebody is doing a play there is a teacher directing it but it was always like an english teacher or a drama teacher that had an inclination towards it and i didn't think that there was such thing as a drama teacher per se and that's a lot um, and then eventually when i i stumbled upon doing my bed um, i did my bed in special needs and uh, i continued to uh, to teach theater even after so in my bed also i did so badly uh, in my first uh, first term of my bed i flunked all five theory subjects so i just before i started my bed uh, i broke up with this boy that i was dating for 3 years straight I broke up with him because I was very stressed. When I did my B.Ed uh, exam, and we were about like a hundred and hundred and some five or six girls who had done, you know, the group, the writing exam, the group discussion, and all of this, and I, I knew with the way the people, the teachers were looking at me that I, I had scored a place, yeah. But later that evening, when the list came out, my name was not on the list. and there were 120 people even though only 105 or 106 were a part of that day's event there were 120 and my name was not on that list and i went into the bathroom and i just cried because i did not have a plan b and um, eventually when i went back to the company that i was working at uh, i told uh, the lady there that you know i i went for the beer thing and it didn't happen my name is not on the list and strangely she had done this post 20 years ago she had done the exact same post in the exact same department 20 years ago and she said you come with me i will talk to them and she she got into a rickshaw she took me there which was like 20 minutes from uh, the studio where i was uh, teaching drama and she took me there and she she told the uh, the staff that hey, listen has been a mistake there is no way this girl's name should not be on the list and she she really championed me there you know and i think that was a very important part had had she not done that for me i would have never gone back and then eventually the staff said that there was a mistake there was an error in the list and just by by mistake my name was not on the list and then one of the staff members just went and wrote my name with pencil and i was like no like don't write it with pencil like somebody just come and erase it and then again you will say five days later i'm not on the list what is this they like no no don't worry and i paid for my own bed course like the summer before that i had worked and i had mm-hmm. created drama curriculums for the company mm-hmm. that i was working for and i had saved up enough to pay for my own course so i was very proud of that also going in wow so that so actually you were already funding your own learning think, yes and education at at that point in time yeah. when you were when i was what 22 and then you continued the one part of your life that was into drama and theater yeah that, because uh, i did so badly in my first year of bed uh, i flunked all five like i said i was just broken up and i did not know i, I was i was stumbling upon all uh, you know stumbling and i was not able to find my grip and i was doing so well in like uh, in uh, in practicals but theory i was failing left right center and when the first results came out my uh, hod at the time uh, she refused to believe that i had failed in all five subjects she was like no alba there is a mistake send all your papers for rechecking and i was like please ma'am jitna mila hai usse kam milega please don't send it for rechecking i know that i have not studied i know that i have you know not done well and it's it's correct what it is it is mm-hmm. um but then i i kind of picked up and i i and i it was a great uh, uh, shake that i needed and i was like okay now you got to get your uh, act together what's wrong with you and i did my bed 
Mm, and again, while I was doing my beard, the whole time I was teaching theater in the evenings and on the weekends. And then when the campus interviews came, there was no way I was getting a campus placement because I had done so badly in my first half. So I didn't even try. Okay. And then I realized that my actually my interest lies in theater. So I have the beard and I can do whatever I want to do with it later. But let me explore this theater thing only. Maybe I maybe what. I should be only teaching theater because that's what I'm good at. And I started working with this company called uh, Theater Professionals and they were godsend. They were a bunch of extremely creative human beings who loved and they were just as passionate about theater and children as I was. And they took me under the wing and I worked with them for a couple of years. Um, but, you know, all this while I felt like an imposter because uh, I didn't do any theater degree and you know how it is right especially in, in your indian in your indian uh, families unless you have a degree are you even qualified that's the thing right so i had my degree in teaching but i didn't have a degree in in uh, performance arts so in my first six years before i came to dubai in every classroom that i was i always thought i was an imposter i always thought i wasn't doing the right thing like somebody is going to find out that i don't know what i'm actually doing and they're going to call me out for it and uh, i'm going to have to start doing data entry at some point <laughs> um but then i came to dubai and i worked with with malvika and I and I and that's she started seeing me for the theater teacher, the drama teacher that I was. And she put so much of faith and it did not it did not mean two hoots to her that I didn't have a teaching degree. I mean, I, I didn't have a theater degree. Um, she just she saw me taking a class. She saw me acting and she saw that 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 is what I was meant to do. And she put so much of faith in me that now I really own what I do you know now I'm in a class and I could be in a class with 500 people and I know I can make it work <laughs> I love where we are right now in the conversation and you've talked into so many things that are valuable for people who are hearing and some things that I know that uh, the kids who are doing NIOS today they will relate to what you're saying and I'm so glad that you said that there's so much more that we need to talk about in that segment which is lovely and the whole moments where uh, shifts happen in our life right the people who kind of see something in us that we don't see for ourselves I think that's uh, those are blessings that just come our way yeah definitely so uh, you know I find myself very often uh, dropping a message to this auntie uh, that that helped me see a profession in theater. Mm -hmm. I keep dropping a message saying that I'm just thinking about you and I'm very thankful because wherever I am today in this profession is because you opened this door for me. Had you not, I don't know where I would have been and what I would be doing. Uh, but uh, the faith that you had in me, because see, the thing is that I come from uh, my family. Both of my parents are not educated my mother studied marathi medium first standard and her mom pulled her out of school to start working as a maid in somebody's house um, my dad studied in Kannada medium until ninth grade and then he got into some trouble broke some windows of the school and whatnot and uh, was thrown out of school and he ran away came to bombay started working um, so i don't come from a particularly not particularly not academic family at all like in my mom's side of the family i'm the second person that has graduated in the entire you know my mom's all of her siblings all i'm the second person to have graduated and i think i'm the last person to have graduated because the siblings who are who my siblings have definitely not graduated and my cousins are much younger so they still to get there hopefully they go through it our family has not been they don't push for academics as much and it's a shame um, but uh, so yeah for her to see the value in me even coming from where I am coming mm -hmm. uh, to be to not have any um, uh, to not judge me for coming from parents who are not educated enough who, who don't speak uh, my mom for, for that matter does not speak sometimes fluent English so for that to see me more than that person it it was it was very important to me at the time yeah it, it changed who i was it opened my, it opened opportunities it opened doors for me um it was it was really something 
yeah. it's a blessing definitely it's a blessing absolutely and and when you're talking about imposter syndrome yeah that is something that i think all of us struggle with in some way or form we may not admit it but it is there within us is like oh will somebody find out yeah that i don't know I, that i'm actually just winging yeah, it yeah i'm just winging it absolutely yeah. like <laughs> will people find out will i be like uh, opened up and then i'll be like vulnerable a lot of us feel this and how did you work through that so uh, i initially i would feel uh, like an imposter because i didn't have a degree i knew i was very confident in myself as to my skills i knew that i was great at running a class at teaching students at connecting i i i had a fair idea of uh, the material and the content that i was talking about i was not bringing uh, that Mm, but it's just that not coming with a degree i felt like um, ki people put too much of the people actually the problem is people <laughs> people put too much of importance in like what kind of degree have you done and how are you qualified and sometimes um, you don't have to have that degree you just have have an have an insight an inclination you know you have a, um, a spark about something and people need to start seeing that more um but i think what i did i mean how i helped myself i constantly made sure that i was doing the best i was constantly pushing myself to do whatever i was doing i made sure i was doing it in the best way i was po- it was possible so that i never get called out on oh she's not doing it properly because she doesn't have a degree so that is um, that's one thing that i did and then i think eventually this not feeling like an imposter as much as i want to say is because i was confident in myself i think it was because of the people around me that were so confident in me um when my shift happened to to dubai and the people i was working with like malu and jena and whoever else um they started telling me that i was great at doing what i was doing and i didn't see it like that earlier and then slowly they started instilling this confidence in me that i didn't have i wish i sometimes that i wish i was more confident in myself from the get go um i didn't have to wait maybe i would have uh, i would have tried harder to be something more but uh, yeah it was them actually that 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 gave me this confidence and i think uh, um that's what i have started to do now when i see children and i see that they're a little shaken i'm constantly holding them and i'm making eye contact and i'm saying that you've got this and i think that also because sometimes i think you need to hear it from others that's just human nature yeah like we we want to be appreciated we want to be told that we're doing well no matter how good we actually might be until we get approval from from someone else we feel like we're not good enough and i want to be at a position in life where i think I don't need anybody's approval but I don't think it's realistic. I think we're all we It could be it's a journey that we all face right? Uh, we look ex- we look outwards and external for that appreciation and acknowledgement until we realize that we have it in us. Yeah. So I think it's just a journey. Yeah. And everybody is in different places in that journey. Yeah. But it's beautiful how you're kind of making sure that that you see that spark in the children. Yeah. And uh they might need to hear it at the stage yeah. that they're in yeah. so that they kind of begin to see what yeah. that others see but they're not seeing in themselves so that's very beautiful and and that's the beauty i think of a drama class is that when a child enters my room i can tell what kind of day sometimes a child has had and um, you know i i constantly am trying to make the time and the space to be able to take a child that i feel like is having a tough day and talk to the, i think at least i try i'm i'm trying i don't know whether i'm doing justice with all of the the 300 children i see in a week but i try to <laughs> to you know uh if i feel like and sometimes you you know when a child wants to talk to you so i'm trying to be more open and i'm trying to identify where i can be of more help than just a drama teacher you know be a ear be a shoulder that they need yeah lovely and and how has getting into the world of drama and theater changed you as a person 
um i i actually don't know when i officially started into this world of drama because i was on stage since i was very very young i can't even remember the first few performances or plays i was a part of because there is no uh digital my parents didn't like take photos or videos i just know that that they say that you know you did this when you were in grade 1 and you did this when you were in grade 2 and i have no memory of any of that now um and um, as of right now i am I'm, I'm, i love to teach i love to teach theater i love to teach drama what i'm not very good at doing is um, i'm not good at uh, memorizing lines <laughs> <laughs> so i have kept myself away from acting because uh, i have come to realize i am absolutely horrible at learning lines <laughs> i don't know whether it's just being as old as i am or what but uh, lines is and you know sometimes i feel really like i feel like i have double standards when i tell children learn your lines come with your lines done and i know that me i can't do it so i feel bad to push them to do it but <laughs> such is life uh, Yeah so I think drama has really shaped me it's given um it's given me the opportunity to be this loud extremely emotional extremely passionate person that I am that I always was and um uh teaching drama being with books reading about people's lives uh, that have been lived 80 years ago or like 5 years ago in a completely different part of the world uh reading those stories is a is 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 a way of um of escape is a way of exploration for me mm. uh so i think drama has allowed for that and i think no matter how old you are whether you've done it earlier or not you should take a class a drama class um okay. or i mean of course like any any form of art but why i stress on drama is because um it it really pushes you to think about your emotions and for and i think right now with between with with kids especially right they're trying to i know a 12 year old who's already thinking about what he's going to do in university and sometimes i feel a little i feel worried i feel like you, you know you you are you are really chasing after what is what is down the line but like are you living in the moment so drama really allows for this drama allows for you to to think like somebody else and feel the emotions that you otherwise wouldn't unravel so that's what it's done it's made me a a very emotional uh, emotionally sound empathetic human being i think i it i can it breaks my heart sometimes the things i read the things i perform the things i direct with children and uh, it really moves me and i think that's that's what drama does it shapes you it moves you it gives you um it helps you to tell your story and it's important for everyone to tell their story whatever it may be and yeah yeah and just be uh, comfortable in your own skin i think yeah. that's uh, that's something that drama brings yeah. in in yeah. Our- and being art. silly yes and being okay with being silly yeah you know yeah. <laughs> there was this i remember in my first couple of uh, months in dubai i had some kids in my class when we would do like just open your mouth and say ah they would refuse to do it because they didn't want anybody to see into their mouth yeah. and i was like are yaar nobody cares how many cavities you've got <laughs> just do it and uh, i keep finding myself doing that and i keep finding myself telling children it's okay like be silly be stupid be funny be a cow be a goat be a horse nobody is going to care and it's, go- it's going to really take that burden off your shoulder i think this burden of being correct and right and polite and diplomatic all the time is 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 it's too much yes. it's too much for children i think they should be allowed to be stupid and silly and funny and um and fart in a room if they have to like we have this beautiful piece that we that we do with our older children it's called yoga fart it's mm-hmm. from a play it's an extract from a play called the yoga fart and it's basically this this lady she's talking about how she farted in her yoga class and there were uh, other women who were wearing this lulu lemon mm-hmm. um i didn't know what was lulu lemon until i came to dubai <laughs> who was who was wearing lulu lemon and she she thought she'd be judged but then eventually she started thinking ki no this is such a release of of um of tension in my body and i'm going to let it go and she kept farting and then eventually everybody else in the class also started to fart because apparently everybody is holding it in <laughs> <laughs> so 
so oh that's so interesting so for me uh, this uh, my world into this whole uh, theater and, and then being open about this be who you are was when i did improv fairly recently so i've always loved performance arts but improv is something i never explored yeah. uh, so i just i saw it one day and i said i want to do that i yeah. want to kind of feel that yeah. and i jumped into it and that's when i totally get what you're saying it's being exciting yeah so exciting and just being silly just being really in the moment like you cannot be anywhere else you cannot be thinking about oh what am i going to cook for dinner or what what or the next day's thing you just need to be in the moment and be okay with whatever comes out of like you don't even know what's the next thing that's going to come out of your mouth yeah yeah, yeah. nothing is rehearsed it's right? so exciting so exciting I and mean, most of the times like when you're doing well at it you're quite impressed like oh wow yeah i thought of that i think and that's what i feel when i'm usually doing improv i'm very impressed by myself <laughs> and then i can get this like these words came out of my yeah. mouth and i could be that silly and it's like it's like this piano where we end up operating only with certain keys yeah. and that's our life right we think that's our personality and this is who we are and then suddenly it expands and we're playing the other octaves on the other end and we're like we kind of begin to be this expansive person so yeah. i think it's a, a yeah theater in general it's it's very Uh, fulfilling in that way. If I could catch all the people on the streets and tell them you should jump into a drama class, I would do it. I have, I, I, I have actually considered doing that. <laughs> Why don't you? Catching all the people on the streets and be like, hey, have you ever been to a drama class? Have you heard of the Hive? Yeah, you should do that. They put me in jail. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Everybody should have something to do in the world of drama. I think yeah. it's uh, not just living a very limited, dramatic life in, in their small, limited world, but yeah. that expansive space. I, I totally love that. Um, I want to now move a little more into the books that you said that yeah. you uh, read. I, I think you might do a lot of reading for the, the whole theater and drama yeah. aspect from an education educationist that you are. Uh, talk to me about that. So the the books. I love books. Uh, I have uh, always loved books. In fact, I found myself. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, uh, and it's going to be documented for the world to know. But uh, I once stole a book from a friend's house because I wanted to read it, and uh, I didn't think that she would allow me to borrow it. So I stole it, and I still carry that, uh, and I'm still very embarrassed by it, and uh, I can't make eye contact with that friend. ever again <laughs> but uh, we all do stupid silly things in life so so what um, yeah i love books i um i is very strange actually my my family they're not a bunch of readers mm -hmm. and my school did not encourage reading at all we had this the world's worst library and the world's worst librarian and she didn't inspire me to read or like we didn't have anything like the i think the best books that we had in that in my in my library when i was younger was nancy drew mm -hmm. um and then i and famous five and i would think that i was on this adventure and that's where my my story started i was <coughs> a big fan of famous five i would imagine that i was one of them and because i was very outdoorsy my childhood was very outdoorsy there would always be a story playing in my head and i would connect what i was reading in the books with the life that i was living which was really crazy uh, in my outdoorsy life was very crazy as a child um, later on i will tell you how i got uh, uh, chased by a wild boar <laughs> wow okay yeah so um, yeah i was uh, this you know when i was in when i was in college in my 11th standard um one of my seniors i had asked a, a girl that was in my in a, in a senior class if she had any books that i could borrow and she bought me the alchemist and um, and i started reading it just before lectures of the day started and i could not put it down the entire day's lectures i bumped i sat in the bathroom <coughs> of the college and i read the entire book in that day wow okay i i, I bumped the entire day of class and then eventually <coughs> i realized that that's the thing again what was happening in my classrooms were not of much interest to me so i would go pick books and then i would go sit in the bathroom and i would read the books that i wanted to read for the day 
and I would only go in for attendance and then I would make an excuse and go and sit in the bathroom. And then eventually the teachers would be like, where is Alba? And people in the kids in my class would be like, of course, miss, she's in the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, the teachers at some point, they started giving up. Like they started ignoring the fact that I was doing that because they just thought of me as this problem child who they can't do anything with. And I had moved from Bombay to Nasik. So they thought that I was this Bombay girl who was just being difficult. Um, and all I wanted to actually do was just <coughs> sit and read. So I love children, children's literature. I love Roald Dahl. I love David Williams. I love Ruskin Bond. Um, I think um, uh, Roald Dahl has influenced my my whimsical personality quite a lot. I think if if I could play a, a character, and I keep joking about this, I would love to play Miss Trunchbull. <laughs> You know, I keep talking about this to the kids in my class and they, and the thing is, I'm very funny in class, okay, but kids also know that they can't be messing about in my class. Like, they've got to get their work done because Miss Alba has these big eyes and I, all I've got to do is like, I'm really disappointed right now and I make these big eyes at these children right. and they know that, okay, they've got to get their act together. So, um, kids, they actually agree with me. They think that I'll be a great mistress. <laughs> I think so too. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm actually very like funny also. But uh, I think I would do, I would love to play Billy Wonka. Like, mm. um, so I think a lot of my personality has been influenced by the books that I read about Roald Dahl, uh, the, the books that Roald Dahl wrote when I was growing up. And uh, I've constantly tried to hold on to, to the child, you know, the childlike uh, personality that I have because yeah. I see so much of joy in that. I think that is what keeps my life very light. Um, I I am I'm a lot of a, like I'm a minimalistic person. I don't like very fancy things, expensive things. I love to thrift. I love I I thrifted <coughs> this shirt for ten dirhams. Wow. Okay. Yes. I love to thrift. It is, I'm a hoarder, a little bit of a hoarder, okay? Uh, my family says I have a problem, <laughs> but I absolutely love to thrift. And um, I love to do things that are that are cheap and still stimulating. Like, I love to go to the lake and sit down there with a book rather than going to, like, I don't know, Ski Dubai. Got it. Huh. You know, so that's, that's the kind of person that, that I am. And uh, books uh, have always been... My comfort. I have always had a book in my bag. You know, the book that I'm reading right now, mm -hmm. I forgot it in the in the Bhartubai studio last night. Okay. And when I reached home, I was feeling antsy. I was feeling <laughs> like, oh no, like I had my last 50 pages. I wanted to finish it today. And like, how could I leave my book? And I've told my team person, please call me when you reach because you have to keep that book aside before somebody grabs it. <laughs> So that's that's how I am of always, um, and some of the the some of the books that are very very close to my heart is uh, women authors. I love women authors. I think uh, we should all read. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I had heard that um, the Bronte sisters mm -hmm. had all written with male names. Okay, they did not write in their original names. Like they didn't say who they were when they were writing because they were all told that uh, first of all women were only expected to write books about etiquettes and like how yeah. to run a household and how to have your hair well done and all of that nonsense and uh, if you wrote the kind of books that they were writing nobody would pick it up if they knew it, it was a female author so when i was told this growing up it angered me i am an i am an outright feminist i am extremely vocal about uh, about um, women rights and um, and i'm actively um, advocating for women wherever i go and yes of course i i love the men in my life and i think that it is equal but the thing is that when you have not been given a head start for for what 1800 years you've got to bolster a little bit more and such is life so uh, i'm constantly advocating for women and i think women authors are the way forward <laughs> <laughs> I, I love women authors and uh, one of my favorites is a book that was recommended by Malika. <coughs> 
uh, was um, educated by Tara Metz mm-hmm. Stroh, which you are reading. Yes, I'm right now reading that. <laughs> yeah, I love that book. I think that ladies, uh, that woman's life is is so peculiar and so bizarre, and um, and while everything, while all of the cards were stacked against her, she has still she has still come out as an author that has written such a brilliant book and she's still living a life where I, that that is uh, so inspirational so yeah. i think yeah i love i love uh, women authors i love books you love books i love books and and we will come to uh, the books that you recommend okay towards the end yeah all right so for now we will take a break okay. while you were talking about books and the world of Enid Blyton and famous five I remember growing up where I would read this um, and it written was a foodie, yeah. you know that. Yeah. And that's why her books are so much about the marmalade and the toast and the scones. And I would read all that and I wouldn't know at some and point. And be a Oh my gosh. Yeah, I used to imagine <laughs> when can I get my hands on what is this root beer and yes. why are children drinking it? Because beer is only meant for, for adults and I was like, why are these kids having root beer? I was like very fascinated. Yeah, I was fascinated with all the food that she would describe, and and the eggs would smell and taste better in the book than in real <laughs> life. Yeah, true that. And I would be like, why am I eating this boring food at home when <laughs> when they're able to eat all of that? Yeah. And even toast would taste much better in in Edith books, Blitton's books yes. rather yeah. than. And I would always wonder why can't they make Indian food taste and feel so wonderful? Yeah. But then I realized that Edith Blitton. Two things, as I was reading about her, she was a foodie okay. and she loved animals, but she never had a pet. So if you oh. notice, most of her books always had a dog. Yeah. Fatty had a dog, the yeah. five fine actors. Famous yeah. five, George had a dog. Yeah. So there were always dogs in her uh, as, as pets, but then she never really had a Oh, pet. I didn't know that. Yeah, fun fact. Yeah. So it's it's beautiful that uh, that authors can kind of bring in that. Even today, I, the first time that I what uh, was started baking, I was like, I want to bake a scone. <laughs> I want to know what that is and what that yeah. tastes like. Yeah. And that's what have I you? I did bake. bake. And and mm-hmm. does it taste like something that you eat? And can does does it have an Indian, uh, you know, equivalent? No, it's 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 it's, it's, it's bread. Yeah, you can go to Marks and Spencer's and pick it up now. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. And then put, um, what's that cream, whipped cream and mm. all of that on top. <laughs> no, I need to go and have that. <laughs> but it's also interesting that uh, Indian authors, I think, also need to explore that side of food. Don't you think so? Uh, I think I, have, I, I don't, I haven't read enough of Indian authors mm-hmm. and I think that's a shame also. But I'm starting, I'm starting to pick uh, authors of different culture. So we basically, we're training for Trinity, right? We train children for the Trinity speech and drama exams. And uh, in the grade four and above of this, we need to pick pieces that are different in cultures and contrast in the sense of theme and authors and timelines and things like that. So I'm constantly picking up. I only, as much as it was recommended, I only read Kali Dosaini like two months ago okay. for the very first time. And I read two of uh, two of his books. Of course, I read it in uh, in the play adaptation format. I read uh, The Thousand Splendid Sons and The Kite Runner and I cried. I was just eyeballing. I could not believe. I mean, of course, I know that there are people, you know, who, who live in different parts of the world that are having these experiences. But it just it's just so heartbreaking. And then right now, even though these books are so old, they're, they're like 20, 25 years old, um, they are still what is happening right now in Afghanistan is basically what happens in uh, in the Thousand Splendid Sons and it's so weird that we that this problem was dealt with 25 years ago and now it's back again and and somebody and there are girls somewhere sitting that that have been, that are being told that they can't read and they can't go to school and um, and uh, yeah I think my way of uh, of trying to change the world a book at a time is I take scripts like this into a class and I tell and I and there is this part in um, in the thousand splendid sons where there is this girl called Aziza 
um, who is reading the newspaper and she finds out while reading that paper that she's not allowed to go to school anymore and it breaks her heart and she's 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 a young girl and she's very confused and she's asking her mothers like why why can't i go what's wrong like how can they actually do this to me and i take that script into class and i'm getting the girls in my classes to 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 do and to play this character because i want them to understand that you are in this very same age yeah. group as this girl aziza in this book and her education was taken away from her like this so easily and that is the happening right now but because you are so far away from the reality of that you don't know and you know sometimes they sit and talk to kids in class and they don't know who the taliban is and they don't know what the holocaust was and it really hurts me because i feel like if you don't know what has happened in human history um you won't be able to prevent it when when you see it coming you won't be able to make better choices you won't know the pain that somebody else has gone through and it will all seem so alien so at least reading about what has happened in history will remind you and you'll be so very you won't allow something like this to happen in your peripheral when someone is being told they can't go to school or something like this you'll you'll, you'll be like no like mm-hmm. you know so there are books that are very close to my heart there's a book called mothering a muslim mm-hmm. i can't remember the author's name right now um she's basically documented interviews of women uh of parents who are muslims and raising a muslim child in india and how difficult it is right now uh raising a, a child that is muslim in india because of of the kind of uh, you know uh phobias and and the way people are being treated uh in india who are coming from muslim families and how they're being subjected to violence and uh, things like that and it's it's nice i get children to do that so that's all so a lot of the scripts that are that we do in class they have a very strong agenda from the yeah. team they've got to be moving somebody they've got to be teaching something new they've got to introduce them to uh, we've got to introduce kids to something that is happening in the world something that needs to be spoken about we we were shifting from just western white authors and we're trying to bring more diverse cultural pieces uh where children you know where children start reading because otherwise they will never know what like we were talking about partition literature yes. right and for a lot of the children when i speak about partition literature they think it's just basically like something that was written about india pakistan yeah. but the work that has come out during partition literature it it holds a mirror up to you as a person and it reminds you of the horrors that humans are capable of inflicting on each other and for what you know <coughs> yeah. so that is what is very very sad and that is the reason why i keep bringing in partition literature pieces in class because i want children to to understand that this has happened mm. you know this one time one i was wearing a sari in class and one of the students um no sorry i was wearing a salwar kameez in class and i'm usually in my pants and my t-shirt and uh, when i was wearing a salwar kameez and this boy in, in dubai came into my class young boy he still still been working with me he's been working with me now for years when he was very little he came into class and he said why are you wearing this and i said just like that only and he said are you muslim and i was like hmm see now these are the now yeah, kids this young won't pick up on this unless this is a conversation at home yeah unless your mother or your father are having a conversation about you can't wear certain things because then you will be perceived as somebody and then i became very wary of it you know i became very wary of this this distinction that children are creating and i thought that books stories is a medium where you can blur those lines and you can influence and you can explore people who are so different from you and um, you know i am very proud of this um, friday last friday i convinced a 13 year old boy to take the diary of anne frank home okay and read the book he was standing next to me right here by this books by this bookshelf and he said miss alba please recommend so this is a thing now i'm constantly recommending books and i'm constantly handing kids books and then i follow up with them I'll, you know a week later i'll be like how much have you read tell me how much you know uh, quizzing them on it and all because i feel like otherwise they feel a little like they won't you know 
follow through so this boy came and i said listen this is and frank and it's very close to my heart and you should read it because if you want to know what is what it is like to be a girl especially in a in a situation like that um it will kind of help you be more respectful of the women that you have in your life your mother your sisters your girlfriends and he was like okay miss i will take it <laughs> and he took the book and i'm so happy and i can't wait to see him on friday now to ask him you know how what how is he feeling about the book and uh, yeah so i don't think it's only women authors i think boys need to also read boys again of course they're all reading harry potter and things like that who's a woman who's a woman author but in in that so there's not so much of a it's not a feminist agenda so much but i think boys need to read a little bit of that so that they become a little bit more empathetical towards the women that they will be will they will have in their life and they have in their lives true and and you're actually right we were discussing this the last time we spoke that books are that opening yeah into history into uh, women into lots of relationships aspects. yeah absolutely relationships so things that we i think in history we just learn as facts yeah. we don't go beyond it because there are humans and yeah. there are people but the way history has been documented in classrooms like the history textbook it drives me mad i do not appreciate it at all it angers me to see our ssc yeah. um history notebooks because i feel like uh, you know they fixated over so certain things that have happened in history and they're finding it so hard to tell the whole story to tell the whole truth to go beyond that one thing that has happened and it's all very biased and so i'm not a fan of <laughs> history notebooks but through books that yeah. can be yes. brought in very differently and yeah. that uh, that emotional aspect the human aspect i think can come in very beautifully yeah. Yeah. not how just about knowing dates and Yeah. and what happened yeah. so what that something happened right yeah. what goes we need to go beyond that underneath it to really yeah. figure that out yeah 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 that's it's lovely i'm looking forward to your book recommendations towards the end okay so i think you have book recommendations across uh, age groups genres and age groups yeah so, i might not be able to tell you all the names of the authors because i am terrible at names <laughs> i'm so bad i have to sometimes like even with children you know so i have this trick that i do in my first couple of classes where i plaster the names of everybody on a masking tape and i put it across their bellies and i put <laughs> mine also across my chest and i'll be like okay you know this is a trick of how i try because i see so many kids yeah i just can't remember children's names and if siblings come to my class <laughs> together for the rest of their life with me i will always call them the other names I cannot like it all, and it's I'm very ashamed of it. I'm really trying to fix it because it's so bad not being able to remember some of these names. <laughs> so you also don't don't remember authors. Yeah, I don't I don't remember authors' uh, names, and uh, sometimes I it, it's also very bad. I think I it, it's important to know the names of the people that are moving your life. I will try. I will remind myself next time. <laughs> I'm going to write it across the, you know, across my walls, just to remember. But yeah, mostly I do. Yeah. But sometimes. Right. So we're going to do a little bit of a gear shift. Okay. Um, a lot of things that you mentioned in your journey uh, about the importance of, uh, or the false importance of a degree. Yeah. Of uh, what you've encountered in your life and how how that's kind of influenced you in terms of. Uh, actually created an imposter syndrome at one point and that i don't have the degree so maybe i'm, I'm not, not good enough yeah, i'm not good enough but at the same time challenging why do we need it yeah. so there are in today's world i think that's that's important to kind of understand is there value or not what are your thoughts around this i i don't think that there is i mean uh i think it's more important to be equipped with the skill that you want to that you want to to do or to participate in rather than the degree and i think that um if it means to learn the techniques of what you want to do and what you want to teach and what you want to be a part of then yes go ahead and get those skills but not having a degree or having an extremely expensive degree um i don't think there's there's much value and of course i mean but i mean i'm coming from a different world yeah like my my bed in special needs at that time when i did it in 2014 cost some 35000 indian rupees that's 
a thousand five hundred dirhams. But here, children are going for degrees that are costing like a you know a hundred thousand dirhams, and um, it's bizarre. But I I I don't know that part of the world. Like, if you get a degree from Colombia, are you guaranteed to get a good job? Maybe. Are you guaranteed to be happy at the job that you are at? I don't know. I do, will you might be when you reach your mid thirties decide to suddenly drop everything that you have learned at Colombia and become a tomato farmer? Maybe. You know. So I keep joking. Um, Malu, of course, is extremely um, driven and academic. And when we when we met. Uh, in the first couple of months, I was this person who didn't like really care about academics too much, and I'm still like that. And she'd always say that, you know, like, what are your plans for Raif? Like, what do you think he should do? And I said, Raif could be a tomato farmer, and I don't care as long as he's happy being a tomato farmer. And she'd be like, Alba, you surely should have um, more. You should uh, bigger aspirations for your son. And I was like, listen, if everybody is going to fixate about being an engineer and a pilot who's going to grow your tomatoes yeah. what are you going to eat <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah I think that uh, do what you want to do but don't break your back over yeah. trying to get this very expensive degree and children go into and I sit with kids right who are in university who are finishing university and a lot of the hive children are in Ivy League colleges abroad and I sit with them and, and I've understood that it's difficult to be able to put your child through such expensive colleges. And what happens if your child decides that that's not what they want 10 years down the line? Then what? Then what do you do? And then, you know, so I feel like I feel like there needs to be a shift. Yeah, Education shouldn't be so expensive. Yeah. Not so much value should be put in such expensive degrees because... Uh, I mean, like right now in the U.S., in all of these, most of these Ivy colleges, uh, children are, uh, uh, they're protesting, right, about uh, uh, the pets. So not children, the teachers are protesting for better pay. And because at the end of the day, who's making all this money? It's the, yes. you know, the guys sitting in, in the those cabins and the trustees yeah. who are not, who are not connected to these kids. Who, so I feel like life should not be so expensive and your you should follow your heart and if even if i now i have invested as as a drama teacher my my the last 12 years of my life that is all that i have known and in the next two weeks i am making a very big shift and i have absolutely no idea what how this is going to turn up for me but and of course i'm nervous about what might come but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not held on to this idea that that's all that I can do. And if maybe I had gone to, to Juilliard or Harvard and I had paid that much of money, then I would have felt the burden of, no, now I've done it. I have to stick with it. And I think that is the thing that, that is one of those, those the, the sad things about doing these very expensive degrees is that then children, parents, they're forced to stick with it longer. And that's why, you know, that's why you have adults who then are doing these these jobs that they're not very happy in, maybe. I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, mm -hmm. but I think maybe that might be one of the things why adults choose to be in unhappy uh, workplaces and unhappy professions because that's all they know. And they've invested, they've invested in their MBAs and they've invested in their business schools. And now if I decide to like leave everything and like go start a, a pancake shop, everybody's going to laugh at me. I think that's what people fear. Absolutely. I think you just hit the nail uh, on its head because when, when people do graduate from these kind of uh, big degrees and all of that, you, there is a burden that comes along with it. There yeah. is a baggage, there's a burden. Uh, and uh, you people get forced to kind of live it. Yeah. And uh, where they end up and at some point, lot, lots of people who I know kind of just drop at some point saying, that, no, this is not what I want to do. I want to follow my heart, like you said. Yeah. And I actually know a bunch of kids right now who are following their passion. Yeah. So they are in the ROP community and there are a bunch of teenagers and uh, it's about really following if I love doing something, why not? pursue it yeah. and uh, work in it yeah. and see whether I really love it Correct. and then if that needs a degree then then pick it up then yeah. you kind of already 
know that I want to do something in it. Yeah. So I, I really admire those bunch of kids, and if you get you get to see them, you should. Just yeah. So when I did my beard, mm-hmm. before I did my beard, I took a gap year. and my mother was completely against it she she was very worried she thought that finally somebody in this family has graduated now i want yeah. you to do another degree like do a masters do something yeah. and if you take a gap year you are not going to end up going back to college because that has been the trend in our family um but i said no i really need to stop and experience teaching before jumping head first and doing a degree because Yes, of course, I can change my mind eventually, but it's still it's still a little bit more committing, right? So I wanted to, and then I started working at this place called Sera International in Pune, and it's this beautiful kindergarten, and I worked there for a year, and I loved it. I loved every aspect. I loved getting up at six thirty and being at the school by seven o'clock and welcoming children. uh you know first thing in the morning and i loved putting sanitizer on their hand and checking their temperature as they come because if they were like 2 degrees above their temperature we had to tell parents take them and go back <laughs> immediately <laughs> <laughs> so i loved i loved it and i i still have parents from 2000 what 14 15 who i taught at at the kindergarten who still mm-hmm. are friends with me and we reach out and we wish each other on birthdays and i have uh, relationships that have now lasted what almost 10 years and those kids have grown up they grown up and i see them and you know i had this one boy is called boy's name is arush and he'd never do the work that he was and he'd never like you know do things in class activities and you know? all he'd be like little stubborn and i'd be like arush if you don't do it i won't talk to you and they'd be like no miss alba please talk to me miss alba <laughs> and then some at some point you no know, just because i wanted somebody to say this and like be adored like that by somebody i'd purposely irritate him So that he'd be like, "No, Miss Alba, I love you, Miss Alba." <laughs> really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then you're talking about now making another transition. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Oh yeah. So what fueled it, and what are you looking forward to? What fueled it? My <coughs> son's need for a cat. That is what fueled this entire. That's how this entire conversation snowballed. My son loves cats. Okay, and it's very funny because in my household we're all dog people. Like I've had so many dogs growing up, and my mother does not allow for animals inside the house. Like she's completely opposite. And suddenly my son, like he'll he'll see a cat on the street and he'll sit next to it and he'll start playing with it and. He loves he adores cats and you know he makes it a point to say and because he knows that there are uh, there are more dog lovers and there are cat lovers mm-hmm. he makes it a point whenever he talks about his liking towards animals he'll say I like dogs but I love cats like he wants everybody to know no, this no. that he's a cat lover so he desperately wants a cat and then um, in the house that we live and the kind of the kind of work that I do. um i didn't think that it would be possible for us to have this cat and we kept moving it along and said okay when we move in a bigger house when i work lesser hours when i have more time with with you and the cat and all of this and uh, then the person that i am with right now my partner he works remotely and uh, he said that stop putting everything on the back burner stop saying that you will have this cat 5 years how you know you're going to live for 5 years you know and uh, stop saying that you know you'll do this and and um, he was like let's like you know is this what you want like do you see yourself 10 years living in dubai and for me dubai equals the hive mm-hmm. the hive is all i have known it's, it was the it was the first and pretty much the only place i came and interviewed when i came to dubai um and i have stuck with with the hive in fact 30th of, of september will be Five years for me. Wow! Yeah, okay. <laughs> at the high, so, and in Dubai, and in Dubai. So, uh, for I, I started to realize that I grew up extremely outdoorsy. I, I got, uh, I, I was, I was chased by a wild boar. I have grown up, uh, you know, counting the stars and uh, the the uh, fireflies. and uh, i have gone uh, catching fish with my hands in a lake and i have ended up uh, being in a group of people who've caught over 400 kilos of fish with our bare hands 
yeah i have uh, i have found honeycombs in the middle of the mountains and just taken like a big chunk of it and seen the the wiggly lava in it and then like trying to eat around it so that i don't have to eat the lava while my father was just munching on the entire thing and i was so grossed out but that's the kind of life that i've had you know and it it was breaking my heart that i could not or i was not doing the same thing for rave and all i was doing was two weeks of international holiday once a year and what like what are you experiencing there like you're not you 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 know um it's only for instagram but you're not actually living it um and i decided that i think um i mean i love the hive and i will find a way and we will like malu and me we will find a way to continue to to do the work that i can do from wherever i am but i have got to go back into nature i have got to have a dog and have a cat and and grow some coconut trees and um i am i have been dreaming about growing passion fruit like literally i'm dreaming these things now uh-huh. you know about the 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 fruit trees that i will grow and the birds that will come and eat at it and um I, it's very important suddenly it's become this big shift i have reached i actually it was a midlife crisis for me when i turned 30 it was nothing i didn't feel like anything when i turned 31 last year i suddenly start to think i am in the middle of my life right now and hopefully i am in the middle of my life right now <laughs> and uh, <coughs> what am i doing why am i why am i hopping one ac room to another ac room um i am feeling stifled you know i want fresh air i want to sleep under the stars at least twice a week and it's killing me that i'm not able to do that and it's not making me a happy person and i started snowballing a little bit at work i started feeling um not so excited to come into work sometimes and i've never been that person i started feeling angry a lot and i started uh, my 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 personal relationship it started it started affecting my personal relationship and i started thinking that i don't know i think maybe i'm becoming a little bit of an angry mother and uh, like they say you know like only when you are happy can you pour that happiness into others so i think that this this transition of moving back to india going back to the roots uh, exploring um the country uh, on the road with with my son and hopefully two more which is my animal children uh, in the future um i'm really looking forward to it and what is scary at the moment right now is i'm just dropping everything and going and i do not know where my next paycheck is going to come from okay i have saved up some money for the next 6 8 months and that's about it so <laughs> in the next 6 8 months i have to come up with a plan on what i am going to do um i have a little bit of an idea and hopefully uh, it comes through i i plan on starting a a retreat space a drama retreat space mm-hmm. where children can come and do weekly work uh, you know like two weeks workshops and parents can come in and like a camp where children can just come and play and barbecue and karaoke and uh, play outdoorsy games and swim in the lake and pluck mangoes from a tree i want to be able to extend these experiences to kids and i think that is something that i'm going to work towards actively in the next 3 months that sounds awesome and i want you to extend it not only for kids but also for huh. adults so yes. everybody i think everybody needs to play yeah have that kind of playful spirit in yeah this plucking mangoes yeah like it's it i think plucking mangoes is one of my fondest memories from my childhood mm-hmm. i once we were living in that same beach uh, town that i was telling you and my mother had just left us there for a month for the entire month of may and she'd gone back to bombay and she was working and i was living we were living there and then all of us kids at the time i was probably 10 or 11 years old we went into these mango farms uh, into somebody else's property and these mango farms and i was wearing one of the other girls dresses i never wore dresses but for i was just like being the local person uh, like you know living them their life and i was wearing this dress and i these boys had climbed up the trees and i was standing with the dress holding the dress skirt up and like you know positioning it wherever the mango was going to fall 
and then I then my entire dress was full of like some twenty mangoes, and that's when the the watchman of that area figured that we were like we were like seven eight of us there and we were creating this kind of ruckus, and he came running chasing us with this big bamboo, and all of us kids started running. and me and the other girls were the ones who were holding on to the mangoes right so we were running now with 20 mangoes in each of our dresses with this guy with a bamboo running yeah. after us it was really bizarre but it was so much fun and it sometimes it breaks my heart to think that the kids today their summers are basically video games and play dates and pool parties and pizza parties and it, I don't know. I'm 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 a little bit of an old soul, you know. I feel like you've got to be outdoor. Yeah, you've got to enjoy the nature. The, when I went now in August, I saw fireflies after a decade, and I was like literally sitting there waiting for my eyes to adjust with the light, and I could not wait to be mesmerized by what I was going to see. I already knew that they were there, but you know how sometimes your eye takes time to like adjust with the light, and then I was I was so excited to see it. and the i i and i and, and after that experience i've spoken to like multiple parents and children and some of them have told me they've never seen a firefly and i'm like what what is this life you are living no you've got when i set my place up you are going to come and you're going to stare at a coconut tree and you're going to look for the firefly if that is the only thing you do that day you will do it <laughs> that's most magical <laughs> yeah Really, something. I got Rafe also to sit next to me, and we were just sitting quietly and watching it, and you know, and I didn't know whether he was actually seeing what I was seeing, or he was just telling me, "Ki ha ha, I see it." But then later, I could see that excitement. That yeah, something. What? What is that? What is that? And you know, it's it's really amazing. Yeah, I think I think nothing can replace that kind of amazement and wonderment. That yeah, see, yeah. Right? I really wish you all the best Thank on you. that journey. Thank you. And like I said, I need you to document it because I think a lot of us will want to follow you on the whole journey because it's something that um, I can vouch for many people that they look and say, "Wow, I want to do that too." Yeah. And just thinking that you've taken that first step itself is wow, very inspirational. Yeah. So we are going to follow you. Yes, and, and I'm going to start blogging. I started my. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to start uh, mm-hmm. WordPress and whether to choose WordPress dot com or WordPress org is currently the biggest dilemma in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Trust me, it doesn't matter. Just document it however you want, yeah. and we're going to follow you. Yeah. But you need to tell us about the wild boar. You mentioned it twice, but you've not boar. told the whole story. Okay. So we, I was, we were in this, um, this uh, wildlife uh, retreat sanctuary sort of a situation, somewhere a few hundred kilometers between Mysore and uh, or, or Bangalore and Uti. Okay. And my my family and my dad's side of the family, every year they would do a trip like this, where. Pura, like my dad's five sisters and the brothers would all bring their families together and they do this one together situation. Um, and we were at this uh, that was called Tiger Tiger Ranch. Okay, we were there, and uh, of course I had cousins who were a little older than me also, but they were all sitting and eating their dinner. And uh, my somebody said, "Ki okay, Alba, you finished now. You take some of the kids and go to the room and go to sleep." And there were these cabins that were like a good two hundred, three hundred meters from where all the adults were sitting and eating their food. And this place is very dimly lit because it's it's um, uh, you know a naturalistic place, and they want that that vibe and all. It was very dimly lit. And where I'm walking with somebody, I can't remember which who that child was. Till today, I was walking with a child on my hip. I was myself, maybe ten, eleven years old, walking with a child on my hip. And there are another two, three kids with me, and there was a younger cousin of mine. And and we're walking towards the cabins, and suddenly, I see a stiletto of this animal. I don't know what animal. Who it is, what it is, I don't know, but it's almost as tall as I am, and that freaked me out. And of course, it freaked the other kids out, and we all started screaming. And that animal started to growl, like literally, like growl at us. And I took 
I was holding on to whoever I could and I started running towards the cabin and I tripped and fell and I scraped both of my knees really badly and I picked up somehow and I ran, continued to run and we've gone into this cabin and I'm holding the door shut while everybody else, I think there were four other kids, I can't remember how who all, but there were four other kids at the time and they've all gone and they've hid under the bed while I'm holding onto the door and I have peed my pants while holding the door shut because I was so scared and then this animal comes and it starts hitting at the door. Okay, and I can hear the thuds and I can hear the scratches and I'm just yelling and shouting and everybody's shouting and I'm like, oh my God, this is the day I'm going to die. I'm going to get eaten up by whatever that creature was. And I didn't know yet what it was. Eventually, some staff old, this one old staff uncle who's over there comes with like this lantern and he hears all of us screaming, right? And I'm still holding onto the door and I'm just shaking and he knocks at the door. And I'm like, okay, if it's knocking, should be somebody. it should be somebody else. I, can't, I don't think that this creature can knock. Then I like slowly <laughs> open the door and um, uh, he's, he's asking me, you know, what happened? And I said, so and so happened. And uh, he was like, oh, that must be the wild bow. So, you know, there is this one wild bow that we feed. Mm-hmm. And it must be him. And you must have scared him with shouting. That's why he reacted like this. And I was like, what the hell? Yeah, I, I almost lost my life and I died of a heart attack. And you are telling me that I scared it. <laughs> yeah, but that, that trip was so amazing. I remember seeing wild horses on that trip. Um, and then I started running and chasing them. And then at one point, I was running amongst the wild horses. And... You could tell they were wild, they were not groomed, they had hair that was very long and the tails were so long and their mane was so long and my dad said that those are wild horses and he slowly, very slowly tried to creep up to the hill that they were and then at some point they realized that I was also there and then they started to run and I was, I was such a daredevil. I had no idea of what the consequence of running after a wild horse would be. It could come and would knock me out it would give me a nice kick i didn't think of any consequence i just started running with them that is an exciting story yeah um, and, I, and i'm thinking that you're hoping that rafe will also start have these kind of experiences and stories that, yeah uh, yeah i would hope to say that is that is one thing you know yesterday i was reading something and it said a mother a mother was saying to the child that um i hope you don't uh i hope nothing not a lot happens to you and then she corrected herself and she said no i hope that a lot happens to you but it's all good and i want that for him i want that he experiences a lot of different crazy you know really really bizarre things i once when once when we were driving in kurg i saw one of these big red squirrels uh, f- literally hopping or flying what they do from one v- nilgiri tree to another nilgiri tree. Those flying squirrels. Those flying squirrels. Wow. And it was bright red <gasps> and it was going one nilgiri tree to the other. And I was like, what is this experience? And I love going to national parks. This one time I was in a national park and we were sitting very quietly by the water hole waiting for a tiger or whatever to appear. And then suddenly we hear the crunching of like something mm. okay some bones or whatever i don't know at the time i didn't know what it was I just heard some some noise of like something snapping and we looked carefully and there was this giant python <gasps> that had caught hold of an egret which is a white bird yeah. with the long yellow legs mm-hmm. had caught hold of an egret and was devouring it and the crunching that i was hearing was the bones of that egret Ooh. And I got photos. I have actual photos of that python holding its mouth open like this and like holding onto that egret. I would love to see that. I'll show you. I'll, I'll share it. With you. <laughs> Please. Yeah. So I want to go back to that. I want to go back to wildlife sanctuaries. I want to go back to national parks. Um, I want to take Rafe with me. I think the quiet and the calmness that you get when you're in a place like that and you see how small you are to the world that you are in, sometimes how insignificant you can be really. 
it really grounds you and it makes you very wary of of who you are and how what you're bringing to the table yeah. you know this one time when we were on this uh, on this trip i could hear pecking like tak 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 okay mm-hmm. and uh, the 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 tour guide said that those are uh, these good peckers and i could hear them but i couldn't see them and i could hear them from almost half a kilometer away that's how hard they were pecking it okay mm. and eventually we waited 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 and then the they came in and it was like at 6:30 7 in the morning and you know this the light that little and i could see the stiletto of it going and it's one of my most fondest memories of these two wood woodpeckers just going for it Ooh. on a tree in rantambore and uh, it's also um, and i kept and at that time rafe was already like he was he was already a part of my life but i had left him back home because you have you know you can't have like babies come in i think he was two at the time and while i was experiencing this i was like oh i wish rafe could experience this and i want and we did see a woodpecker when when oh. and we did hear a woodpecker and we saw it peck at the coconut tree when we were in uh, in barkala in august and i want more i want i'm so greedy for these experiences i want every day to be like some experience or the other oh. in nature and i want this so badly for if i will move mountains <laughs> if i have to for him to have the same for, for him to have experiences like this wow and i will do the same for any child like now you know i have been saying this okay to children left right center and to parents in the last 2 3 weeks that put your child in the flight in dubai <laughs> i will pick them up in trivandrum and i will keep them with me for the entire summer if you choose to and i think i i'm feeling very passionate about it and i and you know i know these kids and i know their parents and i and i hope and pray that they feel safe enough to be with me and live with me but i want these kids to have these experiences and i i think that is going to be my 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 motto now is to have children do this have barbecues in the open air and fish on you know my dad used to take us fishing we didn't have like fancy fishing lines and all mm-hmm. okay he basically just take that that the fishing line wrap it around one piece of wood uh-huh. and he put like some bait, bait in it and he just throw it and we'd be just sitting <laughs> there waiting that was our fishing rod that's all like we not the fancy ones that never <laughs> I don't think I saw a fancy fishing rod till my ex has been bought one. I never saw one. That was <laughs> at some point we'd we'd have like one nice sturdy wood like a long branch, mm-hmm. and we tied to the tip of that long branch. That was the extent of fanciness of the fancy. <laughs> yeah, that was a luxury to be able to find a piece of branch like that. Ah, uh, yeah. And you want to sit and fish like that? I want to sit and fish like that, and I keep thinking that if my drama or my all of these plans that I have, if they don't work out, mm-hmm. because you always have to have a plan B. My plan B is I will start fishing. I will become a fisher folk. I will, or I will become an Uber driver. I mean, uh, I will figure it. I keep joking, you know, in class also when we talk about what are the things you like to do and all. And I love to drive. I love long drives. So I keep telling kids that if I was not a drama teacher, my next set of skills is I think I'm a good driver. So then probably I'd be a driver. <laughs> and you know, like that's how that's how lightly I take life sometimes. How beautiful. <laughs> and what would you give then as life lessons to yourself as a, a 16 year old um, knowing what you know today yeah i think i would uh, i would tell my younger self that you are very beautiful in your body one thing that i grew up struggling with is my body i was somebody who um who hit puberty much later than everybody else so i would always look in the mirror and i would look at other girls and i would compare that i had not uh, you know formed my womanhood as much as they had and it and 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 you know and people boys and girls would mock me for it and you know that's how kids are right yeah. um and that i and that i uh, hold i held on to for a very long time in my life so i think i would say that just I I would tell myself that you are so beautiful like you know like don't don't worry about not having formed your breast yet it does not matter it's 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 literally of no consequence to your life um so yeah I I would say that 
I would say um, learn sooner how to forgive. That's something I struggle with. When um, I don't put too much of expectations into people uh, because of the, the the family that I grew up with, my parents and their divorce and all. I've always been wary about the relationships that I form. And um, when I form them, after putting down multiple walls, when I form them, I expect them, those relationships to be the the all of all. You know, I expected a lot from my ex-husband. I expected a lot from my father. Um, and when you expect a lot, you get highly disappointed. And then once you're highly disappointed, you do not, you refuse to forgive. And I have found it very hard to forgive people. And um, I am learning now how to forgive and how to just let it go. It's fine. I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to do that. I'm still learning like sometimes when I'm with my son and if I'm if I'm angry about something, I snap back. I'm a little bit of a short-tempered person like that. And uh, I have been trying to make it a practice that before I respond to something, I should take 10 breaths and just calm down because my son is very sensitive and he's extremely emotional. And I realize that even if I just slightly snap back at him also, it takes him by surprise because that is not who I am usually. And then when suddenly I become this person, he doesn't know what to do with me. And I have told, I have starting to tell myself that I've got to be more wary of, um, of not letting my emotions take over so much. And the impact that it can have on others. Yes. I have also come to realize that, um, oh, you know, I, I joke about this with my team that every time I come closer to a production, when we're doing our theater festival, I become this other personality, okay? <laughs> okay. And I, I apologized for being this person two weeks in advance with everybody, with the new people, with the old people on the team, with the kids in the class. I'd be like, listen, you're going to have to deal with a very different Alba in two weeks. So brace yourself and be better and do better. I keep saying this to everybody. And then the everybody got a little bit of the, a taste of who I was and I was being very difficult. And of course... At this point in June, when I did the festival, the 2023 festival, I was burnt out. I was, I was ready to move country and I wanted that nature and I wanted a break and I wanted more time for myself. And I was already giving out of, you know, out of a well that did not have anything. So I was not being very nice to myself and I was definitely not being nice to the people around me. And somebody from my team at the last day of my of the festival told me, Alba, why do you have to be so angry all the time? And I was, and suddenly he held up this mirror in front of me and I was reminded that you are being very, very ugly right now. You've got to stop. You can't be so, yes, you are passionate about what you are doing. And yes, there's a lot at stake, but you can't let other people see you can't be so angry and you because I am not I, I I'd like to think I'm very kind I'd like to think I'm very funny I'd like like to think I'm um a, a fun person to be around but I can also be a lot of I can also be not very nice and um, and this guy he I think I'm very thankful actually I haven't told him but actually I'm very thankful that he held up this mirror for me because sometimes you need a little bit of a shake you need to be told that you're doing this and it's it's not correct mm. and uh, i was very upset when he told me this i was very upset with him i was very upset with myself that i was being so mean uh, and i was being so driven that it was it was seeming to others that she's just being nasty um but yeah now i'm, I'm trying to be more forgiving i'm trying to be more kind i'm trying to not the thing was, no, that sometimes during production times, no, some switch goes off yeah, in my head. And it's like, we have to do the best and every child should feel like they're important. And every parent should feel like my child is a superstar. And to be able to give 600 children and parents, 600 children and 1200 parents, this experience takes a lot out of you, you know. Um, so I have now realized that I don't need to please everybody. Like... I'm, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to try my hardest to give you and your child that experience. But if I can't do it, you can't fault me to it because it's very hard. Yeah. yeah so I'm being going to be more forgiving to myself and to the people around me.
I think it's a, such a big thing for all of us to learn. Yeah. Being able to self-forgive and forgive the people around us. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> ah, that touched me somewhere. <laughs> uh, so now let's go into the books. Okay. The world of books. Yeah. And uh, I want you to tell what are the books that you recommend across genres. You, we've already covered a couple of them. Yeah. But uh, tell me what's on your list and the must reads for people. Yeah, so my must reads uh, for younger kids, I think is definitely the Roald Dahl series. I think a lot of these, uh, a lot of kids I know, and it's really strange because I know kids who are eight years old and have already read like Harry Potter, mm. and then I know kids that that have not even touched the surface of a Roald Dahl. And I know that Roald Dahl books now, especially in the US, have become somewhat of a uh, of an issue, there is uh, some book bans and all that are going around and whatever. But uh, I think they're, they're beautifully stimulating and they're extremely imaginative and they push that that idea forward. So I think definitely kids, younger kids, should read Roald Dahl. Um, I think the Edit Light in the Famous Five is such a great one uh, for kids to have. My son loves Captain Underpants by Dave Pilkey. He loves them, okay? And he, I find him sometimes sitting in the corner of a room and he'll suddenly start laughing so loudly and he chuckles and I look at him and I'm just like, oh wow, to be able to be able to be moved like that by a book. It's such a joy. Um, and sometimes they like, they talk a lot about like poop and like underwear and all this and it, it can be very silly and sometimes parents think that it's a little too much. But I think it keeps things silly. And there's also very beautiful like illustrations and doodle, doodles and um, it kind of stimulates uh, children to see text. And it's a good introduction to before you get into the actual books, you know, the novels that don't have too much of pictures. I also really, really love this. The world's worst. Uh, mm -hmm. the, this is the world's worst teachers uh -huh. by David Williams. And I love his books. I yeah. absolutely love his books. And they have such great illustration. And they have such great, um, the way they have used words, like, look how this is. Sizzle, kaboom, tada. It kind of, it, it uh, lends itself for performance. It lends itself that when you are reading, you're also uh, living it all in your head as a child. And actually when I read it, I'm living it all in my head and I'm thinking this is really great. So I love the David Williams, uh, these, the world's worst series. I think this is for a little older, like 10 plus children should 100% read the world's worst. Yeah. They have world worst pets, mm -hmm. world worst teachers. Apparently there's world worst parents. I haven't yes. read it yet. Yes. <laughs> then there are the world's worst children that I have read all three books. So those I love. Uh -huh. um, going then a little older, uh, let's say 13, 14, um, I definitely think you should read Harry Potter and the series. Um, I haven't read all of the books, but I think with the kids that I, I, I move with, uh, these kids are constantly recommending it. And they, uh, they're the ones that I feel, they, they're so... Um, experimental with the way they use language mm -hmm. and uh, it takes time to understand those books i have actually i think i've only read the first one fully mm -hmm. i have been um, fearful of the size of the other books so usually that is how i used to book pick books but now that when i move to kerala it's on my list and i actually i'm thinking of holding off harry potter until rafe gets a little older mm -hmm. so rafe and i could read it together Wow. That's my plan. And in the last, I've been wanting to pick it up for the last year or so. But I keep thinking, Ki nahi, I will pick it up and I will read it when I can read it with Rafe. So that we have this shared experience. We actually binged watch all of the Harry Potter movies together. Oh, they watched it? Okay. Yeah. So then we were like, I want for him to read the books right. because uh, I was following this really lovely podcast, uh, mm -hmm. which is called uh, also Malu Recommended, which is The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Okay. 
it's really fascinating it's about her and her experiences and her books and the very the infamous tweets that she had put out about lgbtq and things like that mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's an understanding of where she comes from and where the people that are opposing her are coming from it's a very interesting one so after having heard that podcast fully now uh, i have decided i have to read harry potter but i'll give it some time i want to read it with rave i want this to be a shared experience ah uh, that's lovely talk about harry potter we are a potter head family so uh-huh. we love harry potter and when i read it i read it as jk rowling released the books oh wow so uh, one of her books i think it's the fifth one i remember there was this worldwide release and it was at 3 am here in dubai and we all and, and the bookstores opened Ooh. for so that it was at the same What? time and we were there yeah That's yeah crazy. Uh, so we were that i'm that crazy wow. about uh, harry potter So I read read it that way. I, I, would, I would wait for the next book, next Ooh, book, next book. That's how we read it, and then I reread it with my daughter. Uh, so I totally get it when you say a shared yeah. experience because now when I read it, I still love it, but I see it from a different point of view. Yeah. I see the learnings. I see I see the fantasy, and I see all of that. But yeah. I also see the depth of the books. Yeah. I'm really curious. Once you start reading it, yeah. which what all facets of that book yeah. you read? Have you read her like books? The other books that she re- that she's written? Some of the series. Yeah, I've been very curious about those yeah. also. There's a Ika Ika book yes. or something like that. Yes, I've yes. seen it in the bookstores. I've never picked it up. Um, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, back to you. Okay. Yeah, so then for um, this is another thing that I have come to realize. Okay, because of looking for scripts mm-hmm. for the purpose of performance, um, I have always been fascinated by Khalid Hussain, and he being in this Afghani author and writing very interesting stuff. But honestly, I have only read his books in portions. an extract or two here and there i have flipped through the book wherever i have landed and if it's interesting i have read it i have not actually read the books properly um but over the summer when i was looking for scripts i uh, came across um the play adapted play versions of the books mm-hmm. now the play versions of course are a much faster much quicker read because they they are hour to hour long right to read if you sit through it um and i read uh, the thousand splendid sons and i read the kite runner in the play script format mm. and it moved me it there were such beautiful books uh, the the story that the the play was so beautiful the story that it was telling was so moving was so important it was such an important conversation to have and now i think that if you feel sometimes as a reader right you pick you look at a book and you're like are yeah and how i'll finish this and it might it 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 might scare you i think a trick now is maybe find an adapted play script version of it read it which is it'll be a faster read see how you like it and then if you feel like you want to read the book because you've understood the the essence of the book through the play script you can go back for the more in depth experience of what the author has written in in the book in the novel version which is what i'm going to do it's okay. i have a long list of books i keep emailing myself photographs <laughs> of books that i come across saying okay. that to read in kerala to read in kerala that's what i have been doing now uh yeah that that's that's on my list so i think um for kids who are 18 20 they should be reading khalid husaini i think mm-hmm. the conversation that he is having about afghanistan and taliban and all of these are so important and it's so strange it breaks my heart that these things these problems have happened in the world 25 years ago and now it's repeating itself it's repeating itself you know um yeah i definitely think those books uh then let's see what else i really really like <coughs> actually i i love gulzar so gulzar was my introduction to um to partition literature okay. yeah and then after i read gulzar i read a lot of manto so those were uh, gulzar was easy of course gulzar again writes in in urdu or hindi mm-hmm. so his books are usually adapted by somebody else in english 
and uh, i had this one very interesting book where it was gulzar's actual written hindi mm-hmm. and then the adapted english version of it so i would read the english version and then i would try very hard to read the hindi version because i'm really bad at reading hindi but uh, that was also a very nice uh, one for me partition literature to in- an introduction into partition literature now i think of lately there are there are a lot of books that that uh, there is a uh, if i'm not wrong uh, something malotra i will send you the name of this mm-hmm. author and i'm going to that she her books are also on my to read list okay uh, she talks uh, i know the the essence of the books because malu has read it and she's asked she's recommended it to me basically this lady is interviewing people who have uh, one of her books where they have a, a, an object something that they have held on to since partition mm-hmm. and then it could be a handkerchief it could be a letter it could be a like a sword okay and then they're talking about their life and their experience and how this one thing this one object that they have held on to for the last 60 what 60 yeah. plus years um uh and their relationship with that object and their relationship with with the partition and how their their family was influenced and how their personalities were influenced and how they had to pack up everything and leave to some other part of the world so those that one's an interesting one i will tell you what the name okay. is i can't remember the name of that lady uh then what else uh of course i love the anf i love an frank's diary i think every young girl every young boy uh when once they reach 14 13 14 15 they should read it I think it's very important to understand that um, but of course I have I have now come across some studies that say that this book was not it's not actually an honest truth of mm-hmm. what it is and it may be the case but I I still feel that it that this book has has as as uh, stimulated from somewhere na someone has had these experiences yes. even if it was not Anne Frank yeah. um uh, I think a lot of what we read uh, books that we read there's somebody's reality there's somebody's truth mm-hmm. right so um, yeah it's an important one to read. definitely and frank should be on every child's list mm-hmm. to read uh, i really love um, uh, educated i think her story as this momen individual uh, who who um, has such a dysfunctional family and such dysfunctional parents uh and still turns out to be somebody that you know like when you've been told ever since you're a child that white is not white white is black and then eventually to be able to stand up and be like no something is not fitting right here i should question what is happening i think that's an important one to do then mothering a muslim was a book that i thought was very important again i can't remember the name of the author then there is another book called the refugees that has been written by this vietnamese author uh, who writes about different refugee um, stories and it's fictional but it's of course inspired from somebody's truth again i can't remember the name of the author <laughs> i'll just um, put all the names of the books and things i will send shorts, you the names yes. of the books and the authors but yeah i think we should actively look for books that are uh, that that not everybody in our circle are reading because only then there will be something new that comes up the anxious people that i'm reading currently which is a, a swedish author um and the author's name is fredrik backman Wow, okay. <laughs> yes. Um so his book The Anxious People is such a beautiful book. Oh yes, and if you want to read a funny book mm-hmm. and if you are above the age of 17 18, 18, you should read Born of a Crime by Trevor Noah. Oh okay. my god, such a hilarious funny book mm-hmm. uh but so close to human experiences and I don't want to say much. but this guy has lived such an absolutely funny peculiar strange difficult tough life <laughs> okay and it's a it's something that everyone should read because when you like i did not i follow him as a stand up comedian right and i was watching his stand up comedy for a very long time 
before I actually read his book. So I always thought of him as this funny guy and I didn't really think too much about like what his life is. And then of course stand-up comedians say all these things about like, you know, their experience in childhood. And I, I didn't think, I thought most of these guys when they say it's a skit, right? They're yes. putting up and it's not, doesn't have to always be true. But when I read his memoir, I realized that this guy has lived such a bizarre life like with his mum. Can I say a little bit? Okay. Okay, with his <laughs> mum throwing him out of a moving bus. And, you know, and and him not knowing where his next meal was going to come from and him not meeting uh, his father for most of his life. And it's very funny and um, it's very, uh, very moving because having lived all of these experiences, still being a person who can make others laugh and still being somebody who looks at life with such humor is very inspirational. I would love to meet him in person and he had actually come to Sharjah, mm -hmm. to the Sharjah book festival a couple of years ago and uh, at that time I was crushing on him big. I was like, I was like, my God, he's the love of my life. I was thinking like this <laughs> and I remember Malu saying, go and go to the book festival yeah. and like, see, maybe you might be able to meet him and I said, no, yeah, if I go to the book festival, within those 2000 people, he'd never be able to make eye contact with me and he'd never know that I'm the love of his life. <laughs> I didn't go to the festival, but uh, he's he's somebody that I really look up to. I think he's very funny, despite of everything that he has had to live in his life. And if you were able to do that, if you were able to to have such a chalta hai, khali bali, my father used to say, such a khali bali approach to life, despite of having lived the things that you have, then what a human you are, yeah? Like, I aspire to be like that. And I look forward to reading that book. Yeah, very fun. Must read. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm actually waiting to go back to India. So the thing is now I have put a, a hold. Usually, you know, I'd buy at least two or three books in a, you know, in a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I have put a hold on buying books for the last year now. And I'm just picking books that are around me and trying to read. Because I'll have to take everything back and go back to India. So yes. I'm waiting to go buy a copy of his book and read it again. One wow. more time. The last time I read it was in 2019 and I have been and I have been recommending it left, right, center to people and I can't wait to read it one Go more time. Read it again. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's great. Yeah. And while we talk about uh, his journey, mm -hmm. uh, how can people follow your journey from here on and yeah. yeah, what's the best way to connect with you? I think the best way to connect with me is on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I My handle is uh, Alba out this and that okay um definitely on instagram but hopefully very soon i should start blogging about my life and my transition from dubai city to varkala yes. and uh, and the process of buying land and building airbnb and building a lakeside book cafe is it's all in the pipeline so uh, hopefully I document all of this um, and hopefully it inspires others to go and live their dreams whatever it might be become chicken farmers if they choose to <laughs> but uh, yeah hopefully there's a blog sometime soon that comes out but definitely on Instagram Instagram all right so for now on Instagram and then later it's going to be in some format you yeah. don't know right now fingers crossed <laughs> it's maybe I'll start happen. Maybe I'll document on YouTube. Easiest yes. I think. I just record and post. Correct. No worry about like typing and writing and just nothing. Even do whatever works, but I think just document it to yeah. uh, inspire the rest I'm of I'm actually it. very camera shy. Mm -hmm. And it's very funny. I've been on stage all my life. and But um, I'm very like, I'm very awkward when it comes to being in front of a camera. I cannot pose properly for the life in me. I, mean, I take such horrible photographs. I have my cousins and my sister who have been trying to train me how to pose properly for a picture for years now. But I'll always be like, my shoulders will be funny or my body is funny. <laughs> so I don't know how I will work for a, with a camera. But I, maybe I'll do it through raves. Like I've been thinking that it should through be a rave. Yeah, rave, through raves eyes. Yeah, I think this will work. So whatever works. Yeah. Do document it and then so that we can follow you. Yes. Any parting words, anything as we wind wind up this particular episode of the podcast? Any um, thoughts? 
yeah i think just uh, I, if if i could and if i would tell children i think i would, it would be just play enjoy yourself play have fun be kind to yourself be kind to others and uh, and uh, always have a book in your bag <laughs> <laughs> always have a book that is keeping you company yeah keep always keep a book in your bag yeah Thank you very much Alba this has been such a lovely fun conversation that we've had we've gone through different gullies and yeah. come out of them and had these moments I've had these moments where I felt emotional and then you've t- taken me on an exciting place and yeah. thank you so much for this whole experience my pleasure thank you so much for having me i'm so glad to be able to share uh my life with you and with whomever might listen to this and thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you for joining us on this episode of unmasked with alba if you would like to connect with alba please follow her on instagram your feedback matters to us please share your thoughts on this episode and leave your comments now If you know someone in your life who inspires you, do let us know and we would love to feature them on the Unmasked podcast. You can keep up with all the latest updates and episodes by following us on Instagram at podcast.unmasked or on YouTube. Please also subscribe to the Unmasked podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And Here's something special. Did you know that you can sponsor the Unmasked podcast? Your support helps us continue bringing you these inspiring stories. So get in touch. Thank you so much for being part of the Unmasked community. Together, we are breaking down barriers and celebrating the power of individuality. Until next time, stay inspired and stay curious in your conversations with people.